you don't get interrupted as you try to speak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want you to have a great Friday, my friend. You're too kind, Let's, my, if my friend. Contribution is to, if my contribution is to stay silent for about three more seconds than I want to, I'm ha I'll happily compromise that. <laughs> Well, we are so excited to be joining you today uh, for another Friday edition of RLR. We welcome a case presenter. Um, it would be incredible if someone who hasn't presented wants to present today. Uh, you really have nothing to lose. And I know it can be nerve wracking, especially if English is not your first language as I know how difficult it is to try to learn another language. I'm uh, struggling with <laughs> Francaise right now, or Francais. I don't even know if I should include the S or not include the S, but still, still learning. Uh, so as we're waiting for um, a folks to volunteer, um, I want to give the mic to Robbie. But before I give the mic to Robbie, I would love for Sierra and Sammy to just say a few words. Sierra will be scribing today, and Sammy will be uh, teaching today. <laughs> Does totes mean totally, Hans? <laughs> I, I haven't learned totes yet. Anyways, uh, bonjour, I know. Oh, toots. Okay, uh, Sierra, please unmute yourself and get the mic away from me. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm Sierra. I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm graduating this June, starting my OBGYN residency in July in Tampa, Florida. I'm super excited to be here this Friday. And hi, my name is Sammy. I'm a last year medical student from the Medical University of Graz in Austria. And I'm going to do the teaching points today. And I can't wait for the discussion. And if anyone has a case, please feel free to share it. We would love to learn from and with you. All right, Rafa, here we go. It's always an exciting day when Rafa is presenting. Um, Rafa, you need no introduction, but please say a few words and then start the case presentation and um, Robbie will tackle the first aliquot. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael. I'm the Malaysia here medical student from Brazil. Very excited to um, learn with you all. Okay, so can I start, Rafa? Okay, so this is a case of upper abdominal discomfort, and I'll leave it at that. Dengue until proven uh, otherwise. Ha <laughs> ha, wait, I thought you didn't play that game. Remember on the last video, by the way, uh, Reza gives me nothing but love, but when he doesn't give me love, it sticks. And so on our most recent Patreon episode, he told me how much he hates it when I try to guess the diagnosis from the beginning. And I'm honored that that is pseudo criticism because he just did it himself. So well, we're back. We're back. I, I thought you were going to say on the most recent episode where I mistakenly forgot to give you the accurate chief complaint and yes, ask us all the case. That. Yes, correct, correct. I first for the first time in my life I uttered the following sentence. I don't even know what the problem is, let alone the answer. So um, yes, that was that was also a nice instance. <laughs> Um, yeah, it could be totally could be dengue. And I think that um, the truth is that upper abdominal discomfort should make you uncomfortable. And the reason it should make you uncomfortable because is because it has it carries with it the risk of pseudo localization. Because when the patient says, hey, my upper abdomen hurts, you will likely be tempted to worry about diseases that live in the upper abdomen. But the truth is life is complicated. And so is the upper abdominal referred pain syndromes, which can exist anywhere from things that are right there um, the pancreas, the stomach, the hepatobiliary system, the vasculature, but also things above it, like an inferior myocardial infarction, congestive hepatopathy, pneumonia. So all you really know is that the disease exists within a two-foot radius. You see that math there, Prof. Rez, that's for you. Uh, two-foot radius of, um, of where the patient tells you. And unfortunately, that two-foot radius um, it includes 
the heart, the lungs, the vessels, the pancreas. So you really, really have to make a lot of a cognitive investment. Um, some clues that would help you are to try to establish if this pain is prandial, which would help you localize it to the GI tract. If this pain is exertional, which would help you localize it to the things that require oxygen delivery, the heart and lungs. If this pain, um, uh, uh, I was gonna say one more thing. Oh yeah, if this pain is associated with um, shortness of breath, then you probably make progress to localizing it to the thorax, um, so on and so forth. So in summary, good luck to us. We know nothing yet um, and we'll need a lot more information. Profred, anything to add before we move on? Incredible, Rabbi. Right, okay, so this is an 81 year old female. And this patient complains of epigastric pain for a few days and generally not feeling well. She also noticed some fatigue, some mild nausea, and early satiety. satiety and she denies vomiting, no diarrhea. And she's lost about 10 pounds in the last two months. Um, when it comes to medications, this patient is on aspirin, Plavix, atorvastatin, and she could not tolerate AC inhibitor or beta blocker due to hypertension while she's on, on these medications. And she practices practices a health lifestyle due to her religious beliefs. On review of systems, on the review of system, this patient denies coffee, fever, vomiting, or diarrhea. There is no dysuria, blood in urine or stool, and no head, headaches or neurological deficits. And I'm gonna give you the past medical history as well. Um, for, the, for the past medical history, this patient has coronary artery disease. Um, positive treadmill test three months prior that resulted in a far vessel bypass surgery. Um, prior to the operation, she noted some mild fatigue and sharpness of breath but the symptoms have been improved after CABG. She, this patient also has mild hyperlipidemia and mildly impaired fasting glucose. And that's the end of the adequate. Wow, wow, wow. I will say um, there's a few words that are capitalized in the HPI and I feel like they carry increased weight. And so I have to somehow use those to prioritize the DDX. Oh, don't take away the capitalization. It was relevant. You guys are solving as we thank you. Keep it there. Awesome. Um, you know, what I'll do is I'll tackle the early satiety component of this and then leave the rest for Robbie to um, layer on. It. And it's just so fascinating to me that in the first aliquot, Robbie predicted a few scenarios uh, like exertional or postprandial um, abdominal pain. And you might say, why did he do that? Well, he primed our mind. Like you want a hypothesis driven um, history. And it's so easy where you have a patient in front of you and they may not tell you that the pain occurs after eating. They might not tell you that the pain occurs after exerting themselves. So being able to anticipate what questions to ask is crucial, and it's a good exercise to go through. So Robbie set us up for success. Um, here, we're told that the abdominal pain in this octogarian, is that how you say that? I don't even know how to say the word, but we're trying today. In this 80-year-old occurs um, primarily you know, after eating. That's what my mind is doing. It's taking early satiety, to equal postprandial pain. So how can we learn the DDX in a very simple way without having to memorize? I want everyone to close their eyes. This is where Robbie would be like, you're not closing your eyes, <laughs> close your eyes. Um, and yo, I think in your closing eyes, you muted yourself, which was just perfect. 
I don't know how your eyes closed. You press the mute button, <laughs> I, but it happened. I think you muted me because I was getting off track. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I and now you didn't mute, mute myself. <laughs> you know, so maybe, maybe who knows? Maybe, maybe my <laughs> subconscious wanted to mess with you. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our eyes are closed. Um, Robbie is eating his favorite food, which is almond butter and yogurt, uh, which with bananas. He swallows this food. Where does the food first hit? It hits in the stomach. So can you all think of causes that cause postprandial pain in the stomach? Uh, go ahead and list a few causes. Um, I'll pause for a second and I'll go on to the next uh, organ before coming back to the stomach. Once the food empties from the stomach, it needs correct activity from the biliary system, the pancreas and the vessels. So let's go back to the stomach. If you have a gastric, everyone can open their eyes. If you have a gastric ulcer disease in the stomach, you can imagine when you have food that hits the stomach, you get secretion of acid. This irritates the ulcer and this would cause pain and would lead to early satiety. How about if you eat food and the stomach doesn't contract like a patient with diabetes? This is referred to as gastroparesis. So this too can lead to early satiety. What if you had enlargement of a few organs like the liver or the spleen? Well, this can cause compression. So as food is coming in, there just isn't as much space before you get the signals to your brain to say that's enough. As the food enters the small intestines, you need the pancreas to be in good health. The pan pancreas is heavily involved in digestion and ultimately absorption of the food. So if you have pancreatitis, you can lead, that can lead to early satiety. Ultimately, the nutrients that enter the lumen have to be absorbed in the bloodstream. So you need patent vasculature. So if you have mesenteric ischemia, specifically chronic mesenteric ischemia, this can lead to early satiety and postprandial pain, leading to significant weight loss. Basically eating food becomes the stress test of the abdominal vasculature. And finally, the biliary system. If you have a stone, oh my gosh, is that Gurpreet Dhaliwal in the background? Uh, unfortunately, oh, unfortunately, that was a, a legend. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. He came and blessed this case and then moved on. <laughs> he, probably, he probably figured it out. He probably knows the answer already somehow. <laughs> All right, I am done. I'm gonna pass the mic to Robbie to just summarize the approach and then layer on the background. I love that approach, isn't it? And by the way, you got me really, really hungry um, with my delicious breakfast, which by the way, I haven't had today yet. So I can't wait to enjoy it. Um, so, you know, I think that the interesting thing in the background history is the surgical history. Um, and I think before we get nerdy about what the house surgery, what surgical complications may have, I think it's important to get practical. If somebody is going to have a cabbage, in most scenarios, they're going to have a head to toe workup about their fitness to tolerate that procedure. So if you're asking yourself what what is the health status of this patient before she undergoes a cabbage? You probably would assume that she's in good health because it is a, it is a procedure that has a high rate of complications. So you can make some educated guesses that the time course of this disease process begins after surgery in large part because patients who undergo such an extensive procedure usually have a head to toe evaluation. Now that head to toe evaluation is not perfect um, and can miss things, but certainly gives you a time course as to when this started. And then the question is, is this related to surgery? or not. And of course, just because two things are associated doesn't mean they're causally linked. But I think the connections would be that she probably, she might have had, um, uh, as a result of the cabbage, um, she has, uh, not as a result of the cabbage, it was a marker of her need for cabbage. She has the same disease process in her belly and she has mesenteric ischemia. The more common com the complications of cabbage though have to do with injury of um, structures within the thorax. So things like um, constricted pericarditis or post-cardiac injury, inflammatory disease of the pericardium or pleura, atrial arrhythmias, AFib being the most common. But then the question is, how could a disease um, that be, how could a process related to cabbage begin in the chest and extend in the belly? And that's where I think um, in, uh, invoking the lymphatic system becomes uh, prudent. So did she have a thoracic duct injury um, that initiated all this resulting in abdominal disease? Is, is a hypothesis. Of course, venous injury is possible, but that is usually uh, more promptly recognized. So if you're trying to make a, a schema for cabbage complications, I think um, acute versus chronic is important. Um, and like um, 
Uh, and ones that are relevant to our situation here would probably be wondering about um, concomitant disease and uh, concomitant uh, atherosclerotic disease in her belly, wondering about uh, pericardial disease and wondering about uh, lymphatic disease. And of course, we shouldn't finish this conversation without mentioning the, the rate of um, sinister infections with cabbage with mediastinitis um, being the most one of the most feared complications, but that doesn't seem to align well with the foreground that we have here. There's other stuff in her background history too, um, which really doesn't, um, uh, um, doesn't map on to anything with certainty in this foreground. But whenever you hear that somebody has a quote, healthy lifestyle, you have to make sure that that, uh, that desire to be as healthy as possible hasn't accidentally eliminated essential ingredients required for a healthy lifestyle. And so the attempt to be healthy doesn't always translate to physiological health. Um, I just met a patient a few minutes ago actually who um, was trying to be very healthy but probably missed out on some important um, elements namely B12. Um, yeah, that's what I got. All right, back to you, Rafa. Okay, so the physical exam, uh, temperature for this patient is 36.2. Heart rate 86, respiratory rate 16, her blood pressure is 143 over 77, and she's saturating 97% on room air. This patient is generally tired appearing. There is no pallor or jaundice. Her lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her heart regular rate and rhythm without murmurs. Abdomen exam, there is this right upper quadrant and moderate epigastric tenderness, MRF sign positive, no rebound or guarding. When it comes to the skin, no rash. When it comes to the extremities, no lower extremity swelling. I'm gonna give you some initial labs. The white blood count for this patient was 8.5. The hemoglobin was 12.2 and the platelets were 210. Her sodium was 134, potassium 4.6, chloride 100, bicarbonate 26, BUN 16, creatinine 1.1, glucose 99, Calcium 9.4. Her total protein was 6.6. Her albumin was 3.7. Total bilirubin 0.5. AST 198. ALT 175. Her alkphos was 375. Her CRP was 1.5. Her INR was 1. And urinalysis was not collected. And that's the end of the other quote. Yeah, you know, maybe I can tackle the exam and pass the mic to progress for the, uh, for the labs. And I, and I think the pertinent finding on the exam is, is uh, right up our quadrant tenderness, which is very, which is helpful. But again, with limited um, sensitivity and specificity because of what we talked about in HPI. And the question is, what is the value out of Murphy sign? And Murphy sign, strictly speaking, refers to inspiratory arrest on palpation of um, uh, the right upper quadrant. And that sounds very scary, inspiratory arrest. Your patient literally stops breathing um, for some determinate period of time. And I haven't looked at the data myself. I've just heard that the, the, the specificity of that, it's designed to look at gallbladder disease. The specificity of that, I'm told is not great, but I think we use it all the time. So I will, after this VMR, look into what the specificity is. But if you happen to know that or have access to that, please put it in the chat. Um, but for me, I use that in real life with caution. And I hope that I hope to use this VMR to update my knowledge with more, with more specificity. Um, but you know, the truth is that it's hard not to speculate about the connection with the with the um, with the cabbage and right upper quadrant tenderness plus heart disease. There, there are a couple of ways to take that seriously. Congestive hepatopathy is the first thing that comes to mind, which has fooled us many, many times. But then there may be issues of forward flow of getting blood from the heart to the gallbladder, potentially causing a calculus disease. So I would take that finding 
in real life, if I saw this and I saw this patient, I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna take this, uh, the pretest probability of gallbladder disease is heightened in the face of cardiac disease, both because of venous congestion and because of arterial insufficiency causing acalculus cholecystitis. Um, so I would, <clears throat> I would layer on the lab findings to that exam um, but for, to do that analysis, I'll pass the mic to Prof. Rez. Thank you. And um, Rafa, quick question for you. Do you also have a bilirubin level? Um, just a total bilirubin, 0.5. 0.5. Thank you so much. Um, I think of, of these labs, um, there's a few important points. One, is we're tracking to know, is this patient inflamed or not? And in the HPI, there is no fever. On exam, no documented fever or even significant um, tachycardia. And I'm just scanning the meds to make sure that they're not on a beta blocker. Um, and now here in the labs, the, the white blood cell count is normal too. So, so far, we don't really have a strong signal for an inflammatory process. Then the only... Um, abnormalities in the labs is really the AST and the ALT and alpha. So the liver chemistry test. So how do we approach this? The first step in approaching liver chemistry tests is to either categorize them as hepatocellular, cholestatic, or mixed. Here, we have a mixed pattern. You don't really need to question whether that alpha is from the liver or the bone because the AST and ALT are elevated. When you have a mixed pattern, um, basically we're say, we have to unleash the schema for cholestatic liver injury because the alpha is elevated. The question becomes, is it intrahepatic or extrahepatic? I will tell you, it would be a mistake just to view this case from the lens of a patient who recently had a cabbage because you may miss other common causes of cholestatic liver injury. So you almost need both frames so you don't anchor in the cabbage, but you also don't dismiss uh, the cabbage that this patient had. So is this intrahepatic or extrahepatic? The ASC and ALT being elevated sort of pushes me towards intrahepatic, but I can't say with 100% confidence and we need some form of imaging to evaluate the biliary uh, system. Causes of intrahepatic cholestasis, common causes include viruses, drugs, um, congestion or ischemia. So what I would do next here in this patient, they have right upper quadrant pain, they have abnormal liver chemistry test. It's time for some imaging, whether it's an ultrasound or a CT scan. That would be my first step. Um, simultaneously, if the imaging is unfruitful, then I would be thinking about viral hepatitis and toxin exposures as the most common culprits. Um, the imaging is important. I think the exam doesn't show us that this patient has heart failure. Like um, Rafa didn't mention jugular venous distension or lower extremity edema, but to Robbie's point, you got to include the post cabbage complications like pericardial effusion. So I would be doing a very careful physical exam, maybe having a low threshold to send a pro BNP, assuming we have a baseline value as a sensitive marker of heart failure. Robbie, uh, anything else catch your eyes from the labs? Not my friend, that was superb. I completely agree. Yeah. Mike to you, my friend, Rafa, the third R. Okay, so for abdominal ultrasound. This patient had a normal liver, echogenicity, and gallbladder findings, and no biliary tree ductal dilation. Additional labs, um, hepatitis panel was negative, alpha-1 antitrypsin negative, ferritin and RO panel within normal limits, Oh, no, uh, ferritin and RO panel. Yeah. Um, Anti-mitochondrial antibody was uh, negative. Seroloplasmine was also within normal limits. Soluble liver antigen was also negative. 
liver, kidney, microsome was also negative. And her serum, IgG, and IgM were within normal limits. And that's the end of the all aliquots. Next aliquot will reveal the diagnosis. Amazing. Um, <laughs> well, Robbie, I just wanted to say in the chat, they included the sensitivities and specificities. And look at that range. It makes me wonder, is that test even useful or not? Uh, 50 to 100% has been reported. Uh, thank you to Robbie for putting it in the chat. Um, so maybe we can tackle this aliquot together. But before we do, Rafa, did you say that there was some gallbladder wall edema? Or did you say everything was normal on the ultrasound? Everything was normal on the ultrasound. Okay. All right. So um, we have an ultrasound with all the data being normal, but we know no test is perfect. This doesn't completely exclude, um, you know, injury to the liver or the biliary system. In fact, we know that something's going on in the liver. Like it, the patient has right upper quadrant pain and has liver chemistry test abnormalities. So right now I'm leaning towards intrahepatic cholestasis, but the problem is when we review the causes of intrahepatic cholestasis, I'm not really getting a hit. Like Rafa worked up alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, Wilson's autoimmune hepatitis, viral hepatitis, um, and you can review the drug list to see if there was any medication that was started. Probably in all comers, drug-induced liver injury is going to be the most common culprit um, of these liver chemistry test abnormalities in someone who had recent exposure to the hospital. But um, Robbie, I'm, I'm really lost. Like here, I'm wondering, is there something that we missed in the extrahepatic biliary system that warrants an MRCP, especially if we do the med list review and nothing um, jumps out at us? And I'm not getting much of a signal for um, congestive heart failure based on the exam, but I would still send a pro BNP just to make sure. So I'm left with, is there medication, at all, some kind of exposure we don't have access to, or is there sludge in that biliary system and we just didn't pick it up on the ultrasound? You know, I'm right there with you. And if it wouldn't be too flirty, you'd be holding your hand. I'm just kidding. No way, I wouldn't hold it. Uh, and I think, um, I think the question is how much do we, like I think that drug-induced liver injury is, is a diagnosis that should, we should be entertained. And the question is, how much does the pain and the Murphy sign skew us to persist in the extrahepatic hypothesis? And I think what would happen in real life is you'd probably call your surgery colleagues and they would uh, assign, a, uh, assign some sense of how often they see gallbladder disease after surgery. And I think the, you know, the, the, the line of reasoning that somebody had a cabbage then develops acalculus cholecystitis is robust enough that in the face of uh, positive mild liver enzymes, I don't think a normal ultrasound would dissuade them in real life from pursuing additional testing like MRCP or a HIDA scan. So I think that you need to be definitively sure this person doesn't have any extra hepatic biliary tree complications before ascribing it to a drug for two reasons. One, you might miss the diagnosis and two, you might inappropriately um, uh, preclude a patient from a life saving drug for her um, atherosclerosis. But that is a nuanced decision that is influenced by the degree of pain that the patient is in. And of course, the patient has proven to us, given her stability, that you don't need an immediate answer today or tomorrow. So you can also use the test of time and the trend of the liver enzymes to gauge that sense. But I'm toggling between those two worlds. And I think it's literally impossible to be confident which one it is in this case. But I'm, what I'm more sure about is the need to be very confident that a disease that is linked, cabbage plus acalculus cholecystitis, is excluded to the satisfaction of the patient and the people taking care of her in real life. I don't know, let's see if we've satisfied Rafa. Okay, so this patient was actually diagnosed with statin-induced hepatitis after her imaging and other workup revealed no positive findings. One week after her stop, at rest the team, her symptoms resolved within 24 hours and liver enzymes dropped almost half at one week follow-up. And that's the end of the case. Wow, I absolutely love this case. I, I really like, to me, this is like what we see on a 
daily basis. So I really appreciate you um, bringing this to VMR, Rafa. And that I, I think ultimately was the right approach. You get imaging, you rule out other etiologies, you review the med list, and sometimes you need a pharmacist's help to know what can uh, commonly be associated with a uh, drug-induced liver injury. And then following the, the trend of those liver enzymes, once you hold the culprit medication. But I, I thought this was a fantastic case, both for us to consider the cabbage complications, but then also consider processes unrelated to cabbage. And um, yeah, I, very good. I, I'd be interested to know from you, Rafa, any takeaways from, from you uh, for this case? Um, so I was actually reading that um, it, when it comes to statin induced myopathy, some patients, even though sometimes you discontinue, you can continue to have like uh, complications due to that, including necrotizing myopathy, which was, uh, I didn't know about that. And another diagnosis to consider in this case um, with elevated STALT is statin induced muscle injury. Um, but this patient, uh, they did not collect the CPK to be sure about that. But this is something that you have to consider as well in these cases. And Robbie, I'd love to hear what your um, overall reflections are. And I, I, I remember there is this law called High's Law. I'll include it in the in the chat because drug-induced liver injury can be like really, really fatal. And there's a way to determine which patients are at um, highest risk of mortality. I'll include that in the chat while I give the mic to Robbie. Yeah, no, I, you know, I love this case. I think that the real life analysis of cases like this is you walk into the world of liver injury, you hold the drug hypothesis close to your chest, knowing that you, it's a very common cause. Um, you immediately ask yourself, is this a drug that requires immediate therapy like acetaminophen induced liver injury or drug induced autoimmune liver injury, which are the two times where you need to act right away. But usually you just stop the drug and then you initiate a workup. And, and that's the only way to, to diagnose um, uh, to diagnose drug-induced liver injury is to revisit what you held close to your chest after you've excluded everything else, absent acetaminophen toxicity and some other rare examples. So I think this case is a really good example of how you cannot, there are some diagnoses in medicine that you cannot make um, without excluding the differential diagnosis. It's literally impossible. So I think the hard part about drug-induced any disease is how far do you go to exclude their neighbors? And at the end of the day, I'm learning more and more that I don't think you have to go as far as I used to think because the response to therapy is such a powerful variable. Like the moment you stop the atorvastatin on day one and on day five, the LFTs are better, it's probably not a calculus bullet you know? So I think um, the thing that I'm incorporating more and more is instead of just following the pathway of ruling out other things and then going back to the drug, adding one other thing in the pathway, which is what happened when I stopped the drug? And that tends to be a very powerful data point. So in this case, I, I know we don't have that data, Rafa, um, but it would be really interesting to see, well, while we were doing this workup, what happened to the liver enzymes? And something that would seal the deal would be if they got better by themselves. Yeah, it was one it later is half down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, you mentioned that. That's right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, you you have you're 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 saying, well, what causes transient liver enzyme elevations? And it's not just stopping the drug. It could be ischemic hepatitis. You know, it could be other things, but it, it definitely is good support. It will, cannot be drug-induced liver injury alone if the LTS get worse and worse and worse. There are some exceptions to that, like drug-induced autoimmune injury or drug-induced hepatocyte necrosis. But you really shouldn't then definitely look for a calculus cholecystitis if the liver enzymes are getting worse, you know? Oh, awesome stuff, my friend. Thank you for presenting it. Um, and I will pass the mic to my dear friend, Sammy, for the tuning point. Thank you so much for this case, Rafa. It was really great. I really didn't think of statin-induced, um, drug-induced liver injury. I think we all learned that we should also think more about that because statins are used every day and we see this often and we should if the workup is negative, we should really think about it. So to proceed with the teaching points, we approached upper abdominal discomfort, um, which is a pseudo localization. We should consider 
um, pathologies of the abdomen, for example, the GI tract, liver, spleen, or the pancreas, but also the thorax, for example, the heart, lung, pleura, etc. It, and Ravi taught us that it's important to have a hypothesis-driven evaluation and sh we should look for clues in the history and also in the physical exam. For example, is the abdominal discomfort or pain brandial or postprandial, which makes us think more about the digestive organs, for example, hepatobiliary disease, GI lumen, pancreas, and also mesenteric blood um, supply. Or is it associated with exertion or shortness of breath? Um, then we should think more about the cardiopulmonary system, for example, um, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pleuritis, etc. Then we had the symptom of early satiety, which made us think about luminal or extraluminal causes, for example, peptic ulcer disease, malignancies, compression from organomegaly, for example, splenomegaly versus motility disorders, for example, seen in autonomic um, neuropathy, the most common um, is for sure diabetes mellitus. Um, then we talked about the complications um, of coronary artery bypass graft. Um, it's, we should think about them acute versus chronic. Acutely, we should think about bleeding, um, but also consider graft thrombosis, autoimmune pericardial disease leading to constrictive pericarditis, AFib, thoracic duct injury, and also infection, for example, of the surgical site, but also the mediastinum. Then we had this um, symptom of or sign of right upper quadrant tenderness or positive Murphy sign. And Rabbi and Reza taught us that we should appreciate the approach that with caution because it has limited, sen limited sensitivity and specificity for hepatobiliary disease. And it's meant to be between 50 and 90%. So that's a wide range. Um, so we should really use those signs with caution. Um, then we thought about right upper quadrant pain in the setting of heart failure. And we should think, consider congestive hepatopathy and also decreased port portal flow leading to acalculus cholecystitis. When we see elevations in the liver function tests, there's a score we can calculate or a factor um, that's ALT divided by the upper limit of um, normal, the, the normal, the ALT va value of the patient versus the upper limit of normal for ALT divided by um, the alkaline phosphatase of the patient and divided by the um, upper limit of normal of alkaline phosphatase. And that's a ratio you can calculate. And if it's above five, it makes hepatocellular causes more likely. When it's between two and five, it's more of a mixed pattern. And between um, below two, it's considered cholestatic. Um, when we have elevations in the LFT, um, liver function tests, and negative hepatitis workup and negative abdominal imaging, we should always consider drug-induced causes of liver injury um, they are a uh, diagnosis of exclusion and a great tool is liver tox where they very well described all the interaction and Reza taught us this nice law that's called Heiss law that predicts how um, severe the drug-induced liver injury is going to be and how it will affect the mortality of or the outcome of the patient so Heiss law and lastly also, we talked about complications of statins, which most of us are familiar with myopathy from asymptomatic elevations in LFTs to necrotizing myopathy occurring after discontinuation of the drug and also drug-induced liver injury. So thank you all so much. Um, and yeah, have a great day. Thank you, Sammy. That was phenomenal. Really enjoyed your teaching points. Go have breakfast, everyone, and think about postprandial pain. <laughs> I hope none of you have it. <laughs>